Uh, Carol's just going to get the uh, slides up. So I guess this is uh, phase three of the, of the, the uh, assault of the adjuncts. Uh, 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 Michael Ann and Scarf and me in architecture, and I think a uh, good reason for this, we're worldly intellectuals, we're out there getting dirty and doing things and come back and talk to uh, the academy. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this to Brown Wiseman, who was, uh, when I first arrived to teach in architecture, I had a, a, an office at the top of the Lucerre building. Brown was down the hall and was very, very kind to me and, and uh, said how important it was for architects to talk to planners and something I still do. So uh, good to be here. Uh, apologies, I couldn't make it last night. Um, at my exhibition, we had a dialogue um, with Larry Beasley. It was the only night he could come. Uh, the good news is that will be posted online in uh, about a week, so you can see it. Uh, Larry spent a good part of his uh, time last night talking about neighborhood planning. His first 10 years uh, in Burnaby in the city of Vancouver doing neighborhood planning, uh, and then oh, laterally downtown. Um, so I think what I'm going to do today is, since we've had such a wonderful kind of built form architectural history from Michael and a political institutional history from Anne, there's no need to go over that terrain. So I'm going to do something quite different. I'm going to try to locate Vancouverism intellectually or as a cultural phenomenon, uh, the naming, the idea, its provenance, its spread. So uh, I, I'm, I'm unusual for me kind of ditching history. Other than to show you the anchor image of my exhibition, because I can work down, downtown, uh, and there are some more of these. If anyone wants one, doesn't have one, I'll, I'll get you a catalog. Um, this is the anchor image, and 1955, and the product of a citizens' planning initiative, amazingly. The Community Arts Council of Vancouver was a kind of a fairly old-fashioned pro-arts, pro-civic body. Uh, a lot of very strong, powerful, well-educated women from Shaughnessy and Westside who took a great uh, sense of stewardship over the city. And they engaged the uh, young uh, UBC professor, Arthur Erickson, and his, his new partner, uh, Jeff Massey, to do a little uh, plan independent of the planning process, independent of what was happening at City Hall. And they produced a, 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 a report on the future of downtown Vancouver in 1955-56. Um, in uh, and it's a lot of it's planning and bridges and parking and the usual thing. On the side, um, Arthur walked over the Broad Street Bridge, um, uh, took a few visual notes, went back to the, uh, to the studio and roughed up this drawing which for me is intellectually the beginning of what becomes Vancouver, as I've not named that yet. This is Kitts Point, uh, 1955, before the, the uh, 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 Mayor Phillips pro project on that site. So you have a soaring residential tower on a podium base. The bridge here is a bridge that was to link Point Grey with West Vancouver, part of their plan that, of course, never got built. And then here's um, Arthur's vision of the West End, uh, soaring, 50 and 60 story high, and I asked them about it. They were residential building, quality of life, uh, uh, deck facing west and south, etc. Um, all on a continuous <coughs> urban podium of mixed retail uh, housing and office. Um, and I asked Arthur, uh, for example, that. I said, well, Arthur, is that just a smudge? No, he says, no, that's a green roof. <laughs> 1955, there wasn't a green roof in Denmark in 1955. <laughs> Um, and um, typical Arthur, the drawing was missed, uh, got, went missing. Uh, this little portion of it was blown up. You see where it's been uh, photographed for PMT. And it was run in his first book. And then his office in Laurel Street had a large reproduction of it. When I, like other architecture students, came in to get a, a job, we saw this. And I thought it was a Baghdad hotel. I had no idea. It was his uh, vision for downtown Vancouver. So I, uh, it is a kind of palimpsest of many of the ideas. Uh, so we have a residential tower on continuous urban uh, podium, uh, green roofs, uh, high densification. A lot of the principles that later become uh, public policy and uh, experimented with in a kind of protean form here. Now, the name uh, Vancouverism, um, uh, we're Canadians. We would never be so self-promotional. The name like that. Uh, Vancouverism was, of course, invented by Americans, American planners and architects. Uh, as far as I, uh, the first online reference you can get to it is about 2002, 2003. But I think late 90s into 
around 2000, we were getting a lot of visitors. Uh, Larry was around the world speaking. He said a lot of visitors coming back. And our American guests uh, would be impressed with what they saw with good reason. And it was first a verb. They would go back to the city councils, to their managers of planning, their development community, and say, let's Vancouverize our downtown. And by this they meant, let's increase residential densities, but to do so with public amenity. So I think in a lot of ways, the operational definition of Vancouverism was pretty accurate from the beginning. Uh, it, it evolved from eyes of the verb into the ideology ism. And certainly it was global uh, by 2003, 2004. Um, I was asked by Canada House in, in London to do an exhibition in the pre-Olympic period so by, by 2006, when I was planning my exhibition on Vancouver city building, there was really no other choice for the name of that exhibition but Vancouverism. And I used the, the subtitle, Architecture Builds the City. So the, uh, the, the, uh, I had a reproduction, the bad reproduction you saw. There's a better one in the books. You've had it out. You've got a nice illustration of this. This is the version of the exhibition which was installed at uh, Woodward's. And it was really quite uh, wonderful to have a show documenting city building and the idea of Vancouverism in a, an example of the philosophy in action. So the building itself became some of the, um, if you want, the content of it. Um, and I think uh, uh, we don't need to go through this, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the naming, the definition. Uh, New York Times had a very good operational definition. Um, in a reportage about the city of 2005. So uh, a few sticklers are, uh, the dictionary makers will probably use this as operating uh, uh, invention. But Vancouverism is characterized by tall but widely spaced slender towers interspersed with low-rise buildings, public spaces, small parks, and pedestrian-friendly streetscapes and facades to minimize the impact of a high-density population. Not, not bad for journalism not bad for a one-sentence uh, de definition. Uh, so uh, my exhibition uh, uh, translated in French, we showed it in Paris, um, and it was inaugurated in London. So we're very much in the, uh, the train of kind of cultural icons, names, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, we had the challenge, well, the opportunity is uh, I and Bing Tom and others went out and we raised money in the uh, forest products industry were spectacularly successful. We raised about $600,000. Uh, and so we knew that we had Trafalgar Square in London and a lot of wood, a lot of good brain power. How do we represent visually Vancouverism? Now, we weren't going to build tower and podia around Trafalgar Square. It didn't make sense. And we were also more interested in a broader definition, pushing Vancouverism to, to include other nodes or modes of building. So uh, one of Bing's students had invented this idea of taking cedar blocks, um, shaped female one end, male the other, uh, curved, drilled with holes through the string, cables through like pearls on a necklace, and then you post patch them, you tighten them, and it becomes a rigid serpentine uh, of, of cedar. So uh, with this as the kind of basis, we piled up serpentine to serpentine. We had very tight design control. Uh, we could not exceed the rod iron fence, and we could not touch the grade two star listed uh, former men's club by the same architect of the British Museum. So we couldn't touch the building. So the serpentines were meant to be a self-supporting system. Uh, and there it is uh, going up between the fence uh, and the building self-supporting. All of Trafalgar Square smelled of cedar, and there was a wonderful kind of branding association there. Um, and there it is, St. Martin's in the Fields, the National Gallery, and the, uh, the, the structure there. So, um, uh, you know, the, sometimes the powers of icon is to be non-representational. We want to represent the spirit of the city, the kind of ideas and the ferment and the innovation. And I'm very, very interested in wood as sustain sustainable building material, et cetera. So we, were, we had a, a green agenda there. Uh, the system has since gone on to be used in various buildings, including Bing's own theater in in, um, in Washington, D.C. So, um, so the branding, the naming, something to alluded to, in the, not this point of the panel, but the previous one, is something here, green capital, world's greenest cities, et cetera. We're a young city struggling with self-invention. 
name, who we are, what are we all about. Very, very important process here. Calgary, other young cities go through this. So I think we're on a kind of cultural matrix of a self-definition. Uh, this was an exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery three years ago called We Vancouver. Uh, if you go to the website, it's, it's still a very, very interesting document of thinking out loud about the city. Um, I wrote a manifesto called Hybrid City, which came up earlier today. Uh, a 600 word manifesto for what this city is about, hybrid of Asia and North America, hybrid construction, hybrid diet, etc. I think it's one of the operative ideas. So what I'm getting at is that there are a series of underlying stratas of ideas that shape the city. Um, and I just want to make a point now that we're a very strange city economically, as you well know, <coughs> very few head offices, very little conventional manufacturing. Uh, uh, this is a characteristic of the other portal cities too, Dubai, Panama, etc. You go through them, they all have the same characteristics. Real estate is the largest industry, uh, followed by education. No, no manufacturing, no head offices. Occupy movement, uh, uh, wonderful example, something invented in Vancouver that took over New York, the reverse colonialism. So Callie Lassen and the people at Adbusters uh, coming up with the trope. This was the posting, one day, one time, from Vancouver, uh, a few words online, became a global movement. And, and there you have the profound po uh, political analysis of uh, uh, some of the pro protesters there. This is a great shot of that. So what is Occupy? It's a meme. Richard Doc Dawkins, a neologism, a kind of viral-like cultural idea that spreads quickly. So frankly, Occupy is a meme. Vancouverism, I would argue, is a meme. There is no such thing as Torontism or Montrealism. You cannot reduce those cities, recent city buildings, to a simple a logarithm. You can and have for Vancouver. So it can be seen as a criticism. We're in a mimetic culture, uh, as Senator, and we have viral like ideas that spread around the world. This is just few of the Vancouver generated memes. Greenpeace invented here, uh, the, the modern environmental organization. Cyberspace was invented on, on Gravel Street by William Gibson. Generation X, my ex student Douglas Copeland invented that. That's a global mean. Vancouverism, Occupy, and I'm proud to say Bill Reese's ecological footprint I've added to the global memes list after uh, some, some good uh, protests. So uh, uh, I think we are uh, memicity. I've invented my own words. The condition of generating and growing very like cultural ideas or memes, also meme city, a city conducive to memes, originally Vancouver. <laughs> so uh, that's my uh, uh, cultural location of Vancouverism as an idea in the broader culture. Thank you very much.